All right, I guess I'll introduce you guys. Hey, guys. Hey, everyone. Uh, we're back for another uh, another episode here of uh, Creators Corner. Uh, really excited to have these gentlemen on today. So um, we'll see what happens. But uh, we're really here to uh, to talk about how to grow a small channel. And so we're going to pick these guys' brains. These guys are all pros. And uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So um, Daniel, why don't you kick off who you are, what you do, and uh, say hello to everyone. Well, how you doing? Uh, my name is Daniel Latell. I'm a uh, content creator, channel consultant, um, and uh, brand influencer for the uh, Filmora um, video editing software brand. I also work for TubeBuddy as a uh, consultant on their new feature development and uh, in being a professional pain in their butts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so my area, my area that I live in is helping uh, creators make better content in order to grow their YouTube channels. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. And Brian, say hello. Well, hey, it's good to be here uh, again. Brian G. Johnson. I am an online creator slash a poodle wrangler, according to uh, <laughs> my previous past history. Just really love to share uh, how anybody, regardless of age, race, creed, regardless of the camera equipment you have or don't have, you maybe you want some can just like Daniel grow your channel, understanding some basic strategies and tactics that you can apply to grow. And uh, I think that's what we're going to talk about today. So it should work out pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, awesome. And Andrew. So I am Andrew Can, and I believe that if I can, you can too. I am the uh, head of video production for TubeBuddy. So my job is to make sure that you understand how to use all the tools that TubeBuddy provides to better your own YouTube channel, as well as on my personal channels. I help you using the features and such I did to overcome hurdles in your filmmaking uh, journey. So, yeah. That's Andrew. Awesome, guys. So uh, really excited to have you guys here. And again, we're going to talk about, you know, small channels and... Um, I know that this is something that we talk about a lot behind the scenes, um, but would love to hear, you know, just one or two things from you guys as far as, you know, some advice for someone that has a smaller channel. And honestly, I don't really know how to define a small channel, but, um, you know, what that is. Uh, so, but yeah, I'd love for you just, you know, what's, you know, at your heart, guys, like, what would you tell somebody that has, you know, a thousand, a few thousand, maybe 50,000, whatever you think is a small channel out there. Um, what's a, what's one or two advice for them? And then we can kind of chew on those advice and then uh, do some Q&A. Uh, whoever one wants to go first. <laughs> Everyone's going to Age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in that case, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so nobody I guess, knows what that means for us, Daniel. Why don't you go first, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, Daniel, you go first. Yeah. Take it away. Um, well, I'll tell you, you know, but one thing I know Brian and I agree right off the bat on is that um, if you are a new creator and you're looking to <clears throat> build a channel or if you have a channel that you've been growing for a while and you're really trying to ratchet up your success and growth strategy, um, the number one thing that I think anyone who seriously wants to grow a channel should look at is uh, finding out ways to put the uh, needs of the audience first and really pick an audience, find a target audience that you want to serve um, and put all your effort into putting the things that they are interested in uh, up front in the way you create content. Um, and that can be a variety of different ways that we can discuss later. But uh, that's that's my my biggest, my first biggest piece of advice is learning to listen to the people that you're trying to reach. Got it. Got it. So listening to your audience, it's good. Uh, Brian. Yeah. The, the thing I want to share today is I'm kind of thinking lately, what do you got to do to hit tremendous momentum on YouTube to get the kind of growth that you could be eligible for a silver play button in a year, two years to that, to that kind of degree? You know, what, how can you trigger things in a way and what can you focus on to really get substantial growth? Because that's what everybody wants. And the thing I keep coming back to is a really big personality that you can share either through your own, you know, your own ideas and thoughts and stories you tell, which is always part of the videos we publish, or just really looking at the videos you publish and how can I add a lot of personality. And the thing I want you to think about is anytime you experience something new for the first time, it, there's a lot of power in that. It's very exciting. People love new things. And anytime uh, a channel is, is blowing up, oftentimes they're doing something that's a little bit more redefined. It's a little different. 
and that can lead to tremendous growth. So for example, when Casey Neistat kind of took a look at vlogging and he took it to a high level, he took the idea of documenting someone's life and the kinetic fast pace of that, but then he added in a background in, in film in cinematography and storytelling, and he brought vlogging to a whole new space. Now, uh, I think uh, Andrew mentioned uh, Catherine Manning, I believe is her name. She used to be known as the content bug, and she's doing some things that are a little bit different where she's introduced uh, like some vlog style into her tutorial videos. Mm -hmm. And again, what I really think about is both of these examples yeah, the creator did something that was new and different and really highlighted their personality. Now, this can be super scary. Like, how, how am I going to kind of qualify that? How can I do that? What if I don't have a big personality? I can promise you that everybody does. You just have to be willing to be courageous to go out and, and practice and then really think, ask yourself, how can I create something that's new, that's fresh? How can I do what I do better? And, and really boiling it down to how can I add value in a manner that isn't already being served to the audience I want to get in front of. That's good. That's good. So combining a couple of different things, uh, good example there with Catherine. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Uh, Andrew, what's your thoughts for, for a new creator or a smaller creator? So one thing, especially when it comes for starting on the platform as a smaller creator is that the understanding that you're not gonna find success for just publishing one video, right? A lot of creators are like, I did everything right I was supposed to do on this one piece of video, why am I not growing? And it's understanding that you don't get an award for just doing the bare minimum. It's doing the fundamental things like properly optimizing a video, being courageous, as Brian said, and just continually creating content, right? A lot of people want to just have one upload and they go mega viral, but that's just not realistic for most people. So it's understanding that YouTube really is a long game, right? So the more you do it, the better you get, and the more you connect with your ideal audience, as Daniel was mentioning a little earlier. So it's understanding that being a YouTuber takes a lot of perseverance and a lot of creativity along the way. That's awesome, that's really good. Um, awesome, guys, so there's a lot of chat happening here. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter as well on the TubeBuddy channels. And so uh, if you guys have any questions, use hashtag poodles, because there's a lot of chat happening so we can pull out all the questions um, and then just send them in, send them in. We're gonna be doing a lot of Q&A here in this session. Um, not so much more interview style, so it's going to be a bit more Q&A. So um, I want to talk more. So let's start with, with Daniel's thoughts here as far as the viewer. You guys all obviously have very established channels, um, and so you understand your viewers really well. So for those creators out there, maybe with newer channels or, again, up-and-coming channels, um, you know, not using the word small channels here, how do you, how do you start really understanding your, who your viewers are you know, what their pain points are, what are some of those things outside of like reading comments? Um, what are some of the things that you guys have applied to your channels and, um, you know, to your audience so that you can understand them better? Well, for me personally, the thing has been, um, first of all, uh, really trying to differentiate the difference between community and target audience. It's one of the things mm -hmm. that I really try to instill in people. A lot of times when I'm working with um, clients and they're, they're just trying to really reach an audience, They'll say, well, my audience likes this or my audience responds to that. And I, and I ask them, how, you know, where do they, what are they basing that fact on that statement on? And they'll say, well, they tell me in the comments or someone asked me to do this or someone asked me to do that. And I always try to make sure that everyone understands that the people who are in your comment section or who have already subscribed to your channel, they're your community. They're already invested in you. They've already decided they like what you do and they're going to hang around and maybe leave comments and they want to see more. The people you're trying to reach are all of those people in your target audience who have a common interest that you're trying to share, whether that whether that thing is a resource or a, an idea. In, in a case like mine, where I, I do a lot of tutorials about Filmora, I teach people how to grow to their, grow to their channels and uh, make better content. Um, people who would be interested in that would come to my channel and find that to be interesting. People who have no idea who I am. So I'm always trying to reach them. I'm not trying to respond just to the people in my community, though their needs are important too. Really try to focus on the larger audience and not get sidetracked by <clears throat> little requests down in the comments or you know some, some offshoot that one person wants to see but doesn't serve the greater audience. And when mm -hmm. I talk about greater audience, I really just mean that, listen, I'm into 
Harley Davidson's guitars, um, uh, making YouTube shit content, um, and you know a lot of stuff. But that doesn't mean that the four of us can't all sit here uh, and talk about growing a YouTube channel because that's the thing we share right now. That's what binds us together. That's the overlap, and we're talking to people who are also interested in learning how to grow their YouTube channels. If I start making content on my channel that starts talking about my my Harley Davidson or my guitars or music, I I start veering off a path. And, and focusing on the not the needs of the people I'm trying to reach, but things that I think are important. So that's really that's really the when you're trying to figure out how to determine that audience and serve their needs. It's just figure out that that one starting point that connects. What is that one thing that 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 person across the other side of the globe has in common with you, and that you can use that you use in your content that they connect with, and that creates a bond. I like that. So I like that. So community versus audience. Your community is. Are people that are already hooked onto your uh, onto your content, right, Daniel? So then your audience are the people that, for you, for example, it would be for people that are interested in Filmora, right? Like, is that sort of like just explain? So like, tie that into your own content, into your own channel. How would that apply? Um, I, you know, I've I've given some examples of this in the past. Like, I'll have people come to my channel and ask for a very specific tutorial. Can you show me how to do X? And that X might be, you know, the the, the craziest niche down thing that they want to do right i want to can you show me how to um you know add a i say this a lot add like a certain character can you can you have me i want to add a pokemon next to me in my in my video well right. if i make a video about how to add a pokemon next to you i'm serving that community members needs but the greater target audience might go i don't really have any interest in putting a pokemon next to me in a video um but if i can figure out how to serve both of them effectively if uh if it was how to add an image into your video, I could use that Pokemon character as a reference point and go, I'd like to teach you guys how to add images into your projects. And today I'm going to be doing it with this Pokemon character. That way I've figured out a way to serve the greater target audience um, and the needs that they really all want uh, and still be able to um, serve my community at the same time. That's good. Good. That's good. Um, Andrew, Brian, if you guys want to chime in as well on the idea of uh, your community versus your audience, any thoughts on that? To play off of yeah, what Daniel just shared? This is like absolutely essential and critical. That's the bottom mm -hmm. line. And the fact is a lot of creators really struggle with this. And until they come to terms with what they truly want and are willing to do and sacrifice, it will always be a struggle because the easier way to grow is to choose one target audience. So I want to talk about this a little bit more because it is so important. Um, you know, subscribers are the people that, like Daniel said, have raised their hand and said, I like this, I like you, I want to subscribe. But don't get that confused when you start getting feedback from those people because a lot of times, like Daniel said, their needs are going to um, shadow or over kind of overlay and a cloud would be a great word, are going to cloud the judgment of you in really serving one big broad audience. So for me, it's like YouTube, YouTube growth, making videos. And I want to mm -hmm. think about what my audience wants and needs. The thing to think about for any creator is the more you understand and know the audience, then the easier you're going to be able to create content that they enjoy. So mm -hmm. in the beginning with my first statement, I mentioned personality. The trick is you want to get people to like you because once you have that, you have free license to do whatever you want to do, kind of. The bigger you grow, the more that's true. When you're at 10,000 subscribers, you're probably not there. When you're at 100,000, you probably have more leeway. And when you have a million, you're, you're a really large YouTuber. So, And again, you have that freedom to try things that are slightly different. So how do you make that happen? Well, if you say my target audience is really interested in this thing and you make content that they really love and you're covering the things that matter th to them, then they're going to be more likely to click on your videos and they're going to get to know and like you. They're going to get to know and like how you make your videos when you understand their wants and needs. So the thing to think about is if you let go of subscribers, if this seems kind of nuanced, like what's the difference? I don't get it. Just forget about subscribers and literally think about one group of people that have never found your content on YouTube. Then you say, okay, 
So health and fitness, that's where I want to go. And I'm going to start off with yoga. And you can uh, focus on yoga for maybe six months and really go deep. And you keep asking yourself, what exactly do the people that are watching yoga content, what matters to them? What do they value? And at that point, it's just much easier to create videos that drive results. And furthermore, uh, sadly, when people don't do that, when they're all over the place, it's very, very hard to understand what a group of people want, the audience, the target audience, because you, you can't be an expert at 17 things. It's impossible. Right. Like if you watch the Olympics, you don't see Michael Phelps running through the hurdles. It doesn't happen. You don't see the bobsled team in the swimming pool. Uh, maybe that was actually probably a movie, but I think you guys get the point, right? It's like, so uh, a lot of times it's sacrificing and understanding that maybe I can't have it all, but if I can make it easy for people to click on my videos and I can study that audience, then in time they're going to get to know and like me, and then that will give me more opportunity to kind of branch out and do different things and so on. No, I like that. I like that. Yeah, and Andrew, I want to get your thoughts on that as well. Speaking of, uh, you know, like with the YouTube, with the TubeBuddy channel, like you understand that channel really well. Like I pick Andrew's brain about like, hey, what what should we put up here? Like, what do our audience want to learn? Like he understands that audience really well. But then there's also the community side. Um, so Andrew, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, community versus audience. So, you know, to kind of add to what Daniel said, it really is a balance, right? Because mm -hmm. similar to Daniel's situation, sometimes people want to know such a minute specific feature of TubeBuddy where I could speak about that all day, every day, but it's not going to serve the general good. And even if we made a broad video on it, it doesn't necessarily do the same thing. And that's where, you know, you asked about community. That's why we do community live streams because that can be very powerful to strengthen the community you already have, right? Mm -hmm. So instead mm -hmm. of having to dedicate a whole video, putting all that time in production, I can then have a resource and be like, hey, that very specific question you asked is answered here. And I can direct them to that. So I can not only work on building my community, but I know that for my bigger audience that the community live stream isn't going to be focusing on them. So it leaves me the ability to still build a community, but have those bigger pieces of content, as Brian was saying, as Daniel was saying, so that I can help them on a broader sense with the uploads, but help them in a more specific sense on the community live streams. And it's that good balance you need to strike. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of creators starting, they kind of lack balance. As you know, Brian G said, when you really focus on that one thing and you build that six months of content, what you're doing is you're really building a strong foundation. What I see is a lot of creators are like, well, I don't like the foundation I had, so let's just uproot it and then I'm gonna grow. But the problem is, even if you didn't like that old foundation, it doesn't matter at a point because if you started building a community on something you didn't care about, it becomes an even more uphill battle. So it's really finding what do I care about? What do I want to be known for? Because I can tell you that I know most of us on this panel may have had another channel at one point or another. And we really had to reflect and go, okay, is this what I really want to be? Like I know for Daniel, for example, it was extreme food reviews. For me, it was my gaming channel. It's like when I look back, do I want to be remembered for my gaming or for my filmmaking, right? So mm -hmm. it it really, if you can figure it out in the beginning, really take time, really look at yourself and go, is this what I still want to do? Is this the audience I still want to serve? Because that really matters, especially for long-term success. That's good. That's really good. Um, okay, I want to I want to dig into some of the content uh, and ideas here. There's a really good question, but I want to say Coach Dev's giving Daniel a huge shout out here. He got consult last month, and he uh, really helped her nail down her content and her topics. That's awesome. Um, so, okay, I want to go down here. There's a really good question, um, and this is kind of uh, piggybacking on what Brian shared about having fresh you know, type of content. Um, what's the most interesting, innovative type of video content each of you have seen um, a smaller brand or creator create on, on YouTube, uh, Facebook or LinkedIn? Um, any Anything come pop up to mind, guys? Like as far as like a new, you know, like when, when your new channel, like what Brian was sharing, you know, don't do 17 different things, talk about one specific thing and really nail that, that down before you start talking about sort of random stuff, you know, as a bigger channel can. Um, what are some of the things that you guys are seeing out there for smaller channels do that shows off some of their personality, but still delivering value to a new cold audience? 
Anything come to mind? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I haven't seen anything particularly, but I also haven't been mm -hmm. looking, so that, that becomes harder. What I will say, whenever I do find something that really catches my attention or I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, I usually, I'm never like, wow, technically speaking, that was such an incredible video. It's more like, what was the message that ad or that brand was trying to get across and how successful in that were they, right? Like a lot of times a brand, like let's say going on the gardening example Brian gave, it's like this one this one new tool we came up with will solve all your gardening woes. I'm like, all right, you hooked me. Mm -hmm. I'm not even a gardener, but it's that powerful in like their storytelling, right? So uh, what a brand really needs to do in order to tell an effective story, and a lot of brands feel like they can't, is that you have to understand the people, the characters in your story are the audience you're trying to get to, right? So what is their problem? And this goes to YouTubers too, right? So like Daniel was able to identify that a lot of creators need help with editing and doing things like that. Brian identified that the characters in his story he wants to help are people trying to start on YouTube, right? So when a brand does that successful, that's one thing I think we at TubeBuddy did was recognize that people know a lot about YouTube, but they really could use some help on the back end or just with like understanding the process, right? So that's where the TubeBuddy tools come in. As a brand, one of the most powerful things you can do is recognize the problem and solve it in a creative way. Now, I can't give you a specific example because if I'm being transparent, I haven't seen one lately besides, you know, because I feel like the three of us and even you, of course, Rob, we're also dialed into our own things. We sometimes are just really focused on that. But that's just kind of my answer to that one. Yeah, yeah, I know. Totally. Um, is there is there such a thing This coming in from another channel here on LinkedIn? But is there a such a thing that as a small channel, you need to get to a certain amount of uploads? Like, is there sort of like, let's just get, you know, there's some some experts out there saying you got to get to 50 uploads, just get those done, or you're 100 uploads, you know, is there something, some truth to that? Is that, or is that more of a forcing yourself to learn YouTube? Yeah, I think quicker? that's exactly what it is. I, I think, um, I think that everybody needs to improve by actually doing the thing. Yeah. So the, I think that a lot of people forget the videos they make today give them 50 videos down the line, they're going to look back at the one they made today and go, wow, why did I make those choices? Because <laughs> we all improve. I do it with my own content. I look back and I go, boy, I, I just have come so much farther. And that's why my content drives more views. So specifically, does there need, is there like a, th it's not, don't think of it like I'm making all this consistent, exact content. And once it hits 63 <laughs> videos, that's when YouTube says, we're going to promote your channel and recommend it more on the platform. It's mm -hmm. not that. Mm -hmm. The two things you have to remember is you're getting better, at, hopefully, and honing in your craft with every video you make. And as you make more videos, you give the viewer more to be invested in. If they come to your channel and you've got six videos up and they love it, they might subscribe. But if they go, oh, I really want to learn more about whatever this person's talking about, and it's like, well, I barely has any videos. I, whatever, you know, they might pass on it. So the more content you have that YouTube can surface, the higher reach you'll have just based on the sheer volume of your catalog. So, so the only reason we think about the volume of videos mattering is we're trying to build, we're not trying to build a series of individual videos. We're trying to build a channel that works together. We're trying to build, especially if you're a brand, um, but we're always trying to build things that work together so that content recommends more of your content. And a lot of this starts really engaging the viewers so that they're not watching one video. They're watching one, two, three, maybe even four videos if you're really powerful um, and get them really invested and improve that reach. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Um, is there a specific type? Like, there's so many metrics, right? When you're starting on YouTube, I mean, for me, even still, there's so much data. Uh, and so, as a as a new channel or a channel on the way up, what what metrics, you know, should you be paying attention to? Should you be kind of like focusing on on growing? Um, you know, the easy one is subscriber, but I feel like that's not the most important. Uh, metric, you know, as a as a new channel or as a, a smaller channel. What's your thoughts on that? So the thing to think about is that you can be in New York and you can be like, I need to get to California and you can successfully drive from the East Coast to the West Coast and you can take many different routes and they're going to be different and some one might get you there really fast. Another one might be more scenic. There's no one right way. And it's really interesting. I'm hearing these questions like uh, uh, maybe three questions ago. It was like, what's the best format or like, what's a really interesting style of video? And now we're talking about metrics and we're talking about 
how many videos do you need to upload until you see results? And it really always goes back to publishing a video the core audience really loves. As soon as you do that, you will trigger the algorithm and your video will get pushed out to a bigger audience. The thing to think about is when it comes to the analytics alone, there are, think of it as like, there are a number of roadblocks or hurdles that you have to overcome. And especially as a small creator, and I'll explain why as, as I kind of move through this, the first thing you have to do is you have to begin with keeping it simple. And you say to yourself, and we talked about this yesterday, Andrew, um, and, and what, I, what I mentioned was keep it simple and like what mm -hmm. kind of video, what topic, what idea, will really engage people and have them clicking on your video. And that is the first step to success. You want to have a high CTR. That's the percentage of people that click your video when it's shown on YouTube. And you want that to be really high because as a new creator, the skill that is very challenging for most is the ability to keep people watching your video as it continues. You know this to be true already. If you're watching videos on YouTube, you know most of the time you don't get to the end, you get bored and you click off. So what happens, I believe, for small creators is they're just getting started. They don't have the skills as someone who has published 300, 400, 500 videos over years, and they've really practiced and thought about the process. So they come in and, and even their CTR is probably not the greatest. And then do they have the ability to keep viewers watching? Usually the answer, if we're honest, is no. And that means it's going to be very hard to publish a video that the algorithm pushes out to a bigger group of people. In fact, you can even have a pretty good average view duration or uh, view percentage and a pretty good click-through rate. But if people don't subscribe, it's kind of like, well, the algorithm, YouTube might say, why did they click? And then they watched a lot of the video, but they didn't subscribe. So if you think about these, these kind of milestones or hurdles that you want to overcome, the first mm -hmm. is getting a lot of people to click. The second is keeping them viewing as long as possible. And mm -hmm. then there's more. So end screens, I just published a video a few days ago, and I talked about like the power of an end screen. You can do really great with a short video if a really high percentage of people are clicking on an end screen. It's, it's a very, very clear signal to YouTube. Mm -hmm. They clicked on the video, they watched the entire video, and then they clicked on another video from that creator. When you start mm -hmm. adding these things together and you're able to like, it's kind of like creating a, a, a pie recipe or a chocolate cake recipe. And once you're able to really uh, understand the ingredients, understand the mixing, and then you've got to bake it right, you do all these things right, you've got a beautiful chocolate cake or pie. But what if you forget the sugar? Like it, it ain't no good. So that's the thing I, I really like to think about is that there's no one way to make it happen. But the more you understand all these elements when it comes to analytics, the more likely you can make good decisions along the way. It starts with just what topic are people interested in? And then mm -hmm. I say to myself, is this a longer video or a shorter video? If it's longer, then I'm going to win based on average view duration. If it's shorter, I want to get that click-through rate on my end screen high because that sends a, a signal to YouTube as well. So like all of these things together are really what will win the day. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. That's um, a big, let me add one thing on top of what yeah, Brian yeah, go for mind, it. is I want to be clear. Like, uh, Onyx asked a great question about you know the watch time is the most important metric here. He said, can make a statement. That's true. One thing that I think um, that creators make the mistake of is there is a metric within your analytics that says watch time, right? What you don't, that's just cumulative minute. When you talk about watch time, it's a metric. And what YouTube thinks of as watch time is a different thing because YouTube thinks of it more in terms of expected watch time per impression. So they're really dealing with looking at your piece of content, how often they surface it, how often does it get clicked, when it gets clicked, how long do people watch, do they watch all the way through? What do they do next after they click away from that video? So the way YouTube is thinking about watch time, don't just think about that one metric that you find in analytics and go, that's the most important one. Think of watch time as sort of a package of pe getting people to click, watch, start watching, keep watching, and what they might do next, which is hopefully move on to another piece of your content, which is most most beneficial to you. Um, but, but what YouTube is paying attention to is, do they continue to watch during the session? Are they watching more 
uh, videos on YouTube. So watch time is a bit of a bigger thing than just that little slice of number you see in, in your YouTube studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I can add to that, one thing I really like that you mentioned there, Daniel, was that impression, right? Like a lot of people, like they'll, like you said, they'll hone in on one thing, but they don't truly understand what an impression is, right? So like when an impression happens, it's just YouTube showing your content on the platform. And while that seems simple, it really goes into the next thing. A lot of people are like, well, I have a high CTR, Daniel. Why isn't YouTube suggesting me? And then you look at the impressions and they have 100% CTR <clears throat> because they showed it to one person and that person happened to click through, right? So similar to how people say tags alone don't matter, I'm going to say that CTR alone without the understanding of impressions, it doesn't serve you much good because if you can't understand the difference in how that flows together becomes more difficult. But here's the thing, to add on to what Daniel and Brian are saying, in order to get those impressions up, in order to do those things well, is you have to understand the message you are sharing with your videos, because that's when you, when you understand that, then it's time to go into those metrics, because a lot of times people will say, this is a great video, it's doing great, but they look at it and they feel proud of the video they created, but they don't understand the data past it, right? So it's understanding that you can be very proud of a video you create. There's nothing wrong with it. Creating videos is hard. I don't think anyone on this panel and anyone who's ever tried to create anything is going to say it's easy. But it's mm -hmm. understanding that creating video on this platform is half the job. The other half is understanding the audience, understanding everything else that comes with it. Got it. Got it. You know, one, uh, one, one thing I want to add before we move on is yeah. it's sometimes it's so obvious and it's so right in front of us that we miss it. Mm -hmm. If you go into your YouTube studio and you click on videos from there, you, you're going to see a list of all your individual videos. If you click on one of those, now you're taking taken inside to the studio dashboard for that individual video. Mm -hmm. Then you want to click on analytics. So the first thing to think about is YouTube promotes videos and you want to measure these analytics on a per video basis. And once you're looking at the analytics for each individual video, the first page shows a gray bar and it's kind of like, this is your channel average. And then your most recent video is going to be uh, displayed with a blue line for views and watch time. And simply put, it makes sense too. It says overview. And the overview is how your video is performing. You want the blue line to be above the average. And then if you start clicking into the, the other links, the other one is uh, reach, and that's the CTR, you're gonna see how is this video performing in terms of CTR. Then you go to engagement, and then engagement really uh, covers the watch time metrics. And, and like Daniel said, there's a lot to watch time. It's not just it's not just how many minutes you get. There are so many deep things about a watch time. But the more you click through these and you look at these uh, uh, metrics for your individual videos, the more it starts to make sense. But at the end of the day, you know, we can do so well by keeping things simple and saying, I need to create a great video about this specific thing. I don't need to make it 10 minutes. My viewers right. aren't like, I really hope there's a 10 minute video on this subject. They're, they want to watch a great video. And when you focus on that and that becomes the driving force, you're going to be more likely to achieve that result you're after and you will get what you want as well. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, okay, <clears throat> sounds good. So we're going to go into full Q&A mode here, guys. We've already been, really. So if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. We're going to just be asking all of your questions and rapid firing them. So uh, drop them in the chat. Use hashtag poodles, and that way we can pull them out here. So uh, Dole Whip Dad has a really good question. Um, all of you are in the YouTube creation coaching space, you know, YouTube expert space. What made you decide that route over your passion for guitars or poodles or gaming uh, or whatever I do here in Canada? <laughs> so <laughs> I ask myself that every day. Uh, no, but, but yeah, what, I mean, I know you guys, I think you guys still have some other channels as well. Um, you know, you obviously have other passions outside of YouTube and creating, you know, content. Um, what made you decide, you know, to dive into this space. I think that's what Jeff's question is here. Well, that was easy for me. I don't own a poodle. So that just cut that way out of this place. Yeah, and I'm, I'm um, terrible at guitars. Right? Brian won't give me one of his. He's got two, but he won't share a single one. No. Um, no, for me, you know, it's really funny because um, a lot of you guys know that Br Brian actually helped me develop my channel. He was a guy that 
um, I turned to when I was really starting to f figure out how I wanted to get onto YouTube and I didn't have all the answers. I turned to someone who had more knowledge than me and mm -hmm. that was Brian G. Johnson. Um, and we talked about that. Like he said to me, Daniel, do you, have you thought about doing music? You've been in the music business a big percentage of your life. Isn't that something you want to talk about? And I, for me, it was a personal choice because I had been in the music business for a long time. I had toured internationally. I had signed multiple record label deals. I had done all that and it had exhausted me. And in my head, the idea of creating another business type thing, because when I was approaching creating a channel, it, I knew I was in this to win it. I was in it to make it be to drive revenue and to do something so that this would be my full time career. I just didn't know how much I wanted to get back into that ultra competitive music space because if anyone's ever seen musicians they're the most egotistical hard-headed knuckleheads like me um that can be out there and i was like I i'm gonna let the young guys you know own that space the people who live music every day and i wasn't living mu music every day um i do i mean i did it for a lot of years but i had gone back to um running my construction company full-time and i wasn't playing music full-time but I was editing full time and I was creating content on YouTube full time. So it was a simple matter of what was that thing that I was living? What was the, the truth that I could bring that, that I could say, I think I have something to say in this space because I'm doing this every day. Um, and that's what it was. It was, it was making content and trying to grow a YouTube channel. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You know, I, love, I really love this question because of the, 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 the journey that Daniel's been on and, and we've been connected and I, I saw Daniel as someone who got who got it pretty quick. Like this is a sharp guy. And I, I remember kind of the, the the time period when we went from Daniel knows me, I know Daniel, and he like gave me some money and we moved forward. And we talked about a few different ideas. And I started down this path of, you know, choose a thing, make that your niche, move forward. We'll figure we'll think about revenue. The first thing you have to do if you want to succeed on YouTube is you have to understand what am I trying to succeed with? Is this mm -hmm. for fun? Is it a hobby? Am I yeah. trying to make money? If it's mm -hmm. for the money, you have to stop. And then you think about, okay, so I could do A, B, or C. And then you want to really break down and think, how am I going to make money from each of these individual uh, different niches and so on? And mm -hmm. do, Daniel made this amazing video. It was just a test run. We talked about cooking for a minute. And I, I remember like, you know, I can, this is a good video. You've got a lot of talent. You're going to go far, but I'm not sold on cooking. And we kind of had this dialogue back and forth and, and he landed on film or, and it was really, it was really neat to see for me, the reason I chose growth and it's really kind of like YouTube marketing or entrepreneurship is like, I've done that for 20 years online or close to it about that 2002. That's mm -hmm. a really long time with <laughs> Google SEO and, and writing books and, and, and I've always done video, but I never mm -hmm. really focused on video. And I, after doing all these different things, I thought it was time to try that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of how I got to where I am, but it's really begin. Uh, it's really important rather to work backwards and, and figure out, you know, what you're trying to achieve. You got to like, right. I need 10,000 a month. Well, how, how is that going to happen? And if you don't do that, you get to this place where all of a sudden you have a big channel and it's not doing the thing you want it to do. And you're in a really tough spot. You're in the wrong niche and it's not pleasurable or you're in the right niche, but you're not making any money. You've got to sacrifice because 99% of the time you don't get to have all your, your wishes met. It's just not right. how life works. Like there's plenty of times when this seems like work to me, but the job I do is pretty amazing. Like I get to make videos. Like seriously, I get to make videos. I get to be silly or funny. Or I get to be serious. I mean, I get to be artistic and I get to make money along the way. That That yeah. is absolutely amazing. So uh, that's that's kind of my approach is, is to work backwards. That's good. That's good. You got to feed the poodles, right? So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. Um, good question coming up here from Tony, uh, but I want to ask this uh, really quick one uh, from Janet. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, should you be making videos longer than 10 minutes? Uh, clearly, on the TubeBuddy channel, we have plenty of videos um, that are like two, three minutes. So uh, what's your advice for Janet, uh, Janet here? So my, my thing is, like, make the video as long as it needs to be that you can 
keep people watching, but not a second longer. And that might seem mm-hmm. confusing, but I see so many people when they start, they're like, I need long videos. So I'm going to make 30 minute ramble videos, but it's 30 minutes. So YouTube's going to promote it more because if I can get people watching the more 30 minutes, then maybe more than a two minute video, people will, YouTube will just suggest me and that's how it works. But the reality is, is how long can you genuinely keep someone's interest, right? Like how mm-hmm. I always tell people, make the video as long as you need to make it, not a second more, because then you feel you've gotten all you need to say on the subject. It's organic. And you're thinking of the viewer first, not the metric, right? I don't think, in fact, depending on the niche or niche you're in, some people might see a 30 minute video. Like if I just need to learn how to do something quick and I see a 30 minute video, it's like, well, I don't have that kind of time. I think we've all been in search yeah. and like we need to solve one quick, simple thing. And then we see videos that are like hours long and we're like, nope. So yeah. length can be a double-edged sword. What I say is make the video as long as it needs to be and not a second more, depending the content you're in, right? Because you said, is it better to make longer than 10 minute videos? Well, what where, what space are you in, right? Because for mm-hmm. on my gaming channel, if I do shorter content, it won't do as well as compared to the longer content because people right. in that space are used to watching longer form content. So it really just depends who are you creating content for? And we keep circling back to that because it's such an important fundamental that small YouTubers are like, I got it, but do you really? <laughs> right, right. No, that's good. That's good advice. Um, don't make it lot any longer than it needs to be. Uh, you can even make a series or a playlist, right? So you can kind of string along those things and it improves your your game too in the algorithms. Um, so Dan, yeah, let us know if you have a follow-up question on that. Hopefully that helps. A uh, really good question here from Tony, and I think I want to lean on uh, Daniel and, and Brian here. Uh, so I know Tony pretty well. He's he's in the Facebook ad space. He's in the agent, agency world and helping small businesses with their Facebook ads and paid ads. So best advice for growing a smaller channel in a saturated niche. Uh, wanting to talk Facebook ads for e-commerce, but there are tons of channels making it hard for me to find keywords to rank for. Um, any, any thoughts on that? And maybe a little bit of uh, what Brian shared earlier of like kind of combining you know, educational tutorial content with some fun content. Like what's some, what's some advice there for Tony? The first thing that I always fall back to is there's always room for good content. There's mm-hmm. always room for winners. It really is true. Anytime uh, someone enters a niche, it doesn't matter how many other people are in it. If the content is good, it's going to rise and it's going to do fine. So the first thing to say is that it is possible and I can do this. It can be daunting. We all have our days. I have my days. Daniel has his days. We all struggle, but we all persevere and we all make it happen. One of the things that I heard from uh, Sally Hogshead, New York Times bestselling author, is the thing to do if you want to compete is to uh, leverage the power of different, which really fits into what I kind of started with. Create something that's new and fresh. Now, as you get started, I would say go easy and don't strive to be so different because that can often land in cringy. But when you <laughs> when you realize that if you want to be number one, that's really hard to do. Uh, obviously, there can only be number one. If you're in business, you could be the cheapest. Well, that's awesome. And then eventually your prices go down to where you're working for free because there's there's no profit margin. So that doesn't work. But if you leverage the power of different is better than better, you don't have to be better than everybody. You just have to be a, an important resource. So th- realize this, that there are all kinds of people right now that want to learn how to increase the revenue to their coaching business. They want to sell more digital products. They want to build a list and they want to figure out how to do YouTube ads. You don't have to be better than everybody else. You just have to do it your way. The thing that I would really get clear on is who's watching these videos and what do they want? Like I'm in this space too. This is where I've lived for a long time. They want clear, concise answers. They want to be able to follow along. They want to take uh, information that is oftentimes seen as daunting and complex and simplified. And the more you can practice making that a reality in the videos you publish, the better. Another thing you can do is leverage the power of proof. Um, You know, show people like, hey, check this out. I was struggling. And then I did this thing. Here's the, the screenshots from my the views or, or the emails I gained or the revenue I made. And I did this through 
you know, targeted Facebook ads and whatnot, you start to tell a story and you start to really push the buttons that matter to the audience. And again, we're talking about the audience. It always goes back to the audience. But I would say leverage the power of different rather than trying to be number one or worrying about uh, how competitive a space is. Like the YouTube education space is very, very competitive. It, there are a lot of really, really smart people. And what I found, as long as you strive to give people what they want, it'll work out eventually. It's hard, but you can absolutely get there. So tell yourself, this is the first thing you got to do. Like, hey, I can make it happen. <laughs> and the other thing to keep in mind is, Tony, um, if there's a lot of content made about a subject, it's because there's usually a lot of interest in that subject. So like Ryan was saying, you know, you don't always have to be the best video out there. You just have to make your way into the pack. Um, one of the things I'm reading in your question that I want to make sure that you understand, I see this not just you, Tony, a lot of creators. I, I'm wanting to talk about this specific thing, but finding there are tons of channels making it hard for me to find keywords to rank for. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, every time you publish a video, forget search. It's going to be put in front of people and people are going to choose to either watch it or not watch it. It, it can be put on their notification tab. It can be put in browse on their homepage when they come to YouTube. It might get recommended alongside another similar piece of content in suggested. So just thinking about, well, if I can't rank for it, I can't make that piece of content. That's just one way of driving traffic when you're thinking search. Think of the larger traffic paradigms and the way that the platform actually operates, that YouTube is, any video you put up, you're going to find there are some impressions. And impressions aren't, aren't just search impressions. They're from multiple different traffic sources. So make great content and you can find, if you make great content, you'll find your way in. Brian was just talking about how saturated the YouTube growth niche is. It's really saturated. Um, but then we look at someone like um, Catherine Manning, uh, Content Bug, comes in and she's kicking all our butts. She's playing <laughs> like a weed because she just came at it with her own flavor, her own personality, a lot mm -hmm. of value, and she's just exploding. And you and you know, we could sit here and go, what the heck is she doing so right? But we know what she's doing right. She came into a niche that was super saturated, did the work, spent the time, made great content. And once two or three or four of those videos really started to connect, then it started bringing the whole catalog up with it because they say, you know, the rising tide raises all ships. The same mm. content. If you start making great content, it'll start getting more of your content recommended as well from your catalog. What do you got going on over there, Brian? Not subscribe. Yeah, it's that? funny because like, uh, first of all, Tony, I hope you're documenting everything like a screen capture, like a maniac. Like mm -hmm. if you're teaching anything online, like I didn't know what I'd be using this for this morning, but you see how it says 31% not subscribed. This is exactly what Daniel is talking about. I published a video 48 hours ago. The video has 5,000 views. And what did I say? Like 31% not subscribed. Now, what happens is when you publish regularly, when you keep trying to improve, you're going to basically get more and more people clicking. And you're going to go into what's called browse as a traffic source. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad you touched on this, Daniel. This is, th th this is like a thorn in my side. I just, <laughs> it, it's really hard to get this message out. But the fact of the matter is, A, you can rank no matter what any tool tells you. So at the same time, you have to understand that when the tool says it's, you probably won't rank, you probably won't, but it doesn't mean you can't. The fact of the matter is the tool doesn't have a crystal ball. It can't read in to you know, what's going to happen when you publish. And if you publish the very best video on ads, it's going to rank. You're going to drive views and so on. Now, furthermore... And this is where people get confused, and I'm really glad that Daniel brought this up, is that when we look at tools like TubeBuddy, which I, TubeBuddy is amazing, don't get me wrong, but the fact of the matter is there are many different traffic sources on YouTube. And I just mentioned 31% of my views came from non-subscribers, and they, and they came from browse. So what that is, is it's people that are on YouTube, they go to the homepage, their homepage, and basically their history, what they've been looking at, the type of videos they've been watching matches what I just published and I've got a good track record. So YouTube says, let's test and put this video in front of non-subscribers. Now, the better that video performs, and it's this isn't search, this is browse, the more likely that's gonna happen on your next video, in your next video. So there are a lot of ways to drive views. The thing I like to think about 
as far as the tools like TubeBuddy is it will help you to understand how competitive a keyword phrase is. Absolutely strive to find the keywords that are easier to rank for. And the better you get at keyword research, the more likely you're going to find a keyword that is a little bit easier to rank for. And at the same time, sometimes it's a rock and a hard place. And the best thing to do, if you feel like this is a really good video, this is the best keyword and this is the best title, then move forward. That's good advice. Andrew, yeah. anything you want to add there as far as keyword research? Because that's <laughs> we do this every week in TubeBuddy 101, but anything for, for Tony there as far as keyword research? Well, uh, yeah, fine. one, just to kind of add to both what both Brian and Daniel were saying is mm -hmm. like, if you feel like you can compete, which is something that a lot of people don't, it's hard to quantify, but it does exist, right? Is like, if you had that need to make the video, then make the video. However, mm -hmm. like going back to what Brian said is it's being realistic in your expectations. Sometimes that video may not pop right away, but it might be just because you don't have the authority yet, right? Like if you're so hesitant to make any videos about Facebook ads for you. He was caught mid-sentence. So much oh, no. powerful value. <laughs> Andrew. He had to catch his breath. To finish We're so close. Time. So <laughs> close. All right. Well, Andrew tries to uh, – I'm going to take Andrew off the screen here, and he's going to try and come back. Uh, there's a good follow-up question here. Tony, hopefully that answers this question, man. You got some gold nuggets there from uh, Brian and Daniel here. Um, a follow-up question. So 91, uh, going full nerd says, 91% of my views are not subscribed, and they watch my videos longer. How do I get them to commit? Now, I guess – Two parts in my head is that is getting them to subscribe something that I should it, that that going full nerd should be really trying to do in future videos, um, and and then any advice there for for uh, going full nerd. So off. then once you do that, you'll hit a million <laughs> subscribers, and that's the true secret to YouTube success. And so if you just follow those simple steps. That's all you got to do. So and that's how you solve global warming. <laughs> that's exactly, awesome. Right? I love so that. I, love I have that. no idea where I went off, but basically all I was trying to say is don't be so afraid to create content that you don't have any points of reference in where you want to be. If that's Facebook ads for you, then start creating the content, as Brian said, anyway, so you can start at least having that in the backlog. A huge mistake mm. I see creators do is that they're so afraid because of – and TubeBuddy is a tool that can do this to people. They'll be so afraid to even make content mm. that they're thinking of it all wrong, that they don't have that backlog to work on, which is why we tell people just create the videos. Because so many times people will look for reasons not to create a piece of content instead of all the reasons they should. Mm. Good, and sorry for advice. getting us off the uh, track. No, it's okay. We, <laughs> no, we haven't even started this next question yet. <laughs> we haven't started this next question, but that's good. Good advice, man. Good advice. Um, so for this um, next, well, I'm noticing that going full nerd looks like he had the exact same profile picture as the one of the other channel names. Are you swapping on us? You trying to? You trying to <laughs> spoof us? Um, <laughs> uh, when we talk about uh, the amount of um, people that are not subscribed to your channel, depending on your channel size, don't get freaked out by that. One thing you want to realize is if you're if your channel is driving a lot more views from subscribed members than it is non-subscribed, then you really do have a problem. That's actually a worst case scenario because that means that your content is not being served to a lot of people who don't know who you are. The only way you can grow a channel is it being served, is your content being served out to a lot of people who are not subscribed. They have no idea who you are. That's a good thing. What we want to look at is, is, you know, how many videos do you have on your channel? How long has the channel been around? Because what happens is you've been around for a while and you start building some momentum, you'll start getting more conversion. And as new videos are published, they'll have a larger subscriber base to serve those videos too. So you'll start seeing more views from those subscribers. And this, and it's a really random numbers, but somewhere in the area of a 80, 20 mix is, you know, like Roberto Blake would probably say an 80, 20 is a good place to live. I tend to be a little heavier than that. I tend to be probably 27% of me, 25, 27% from my subscriber base and then the rest from non-subscribers. But when I see that subscriber views get too big, when it starts pushing 30%, I get nervous. I start going, man, I really need to start reaching more people who don't know who I am. So uh, don't worry about getting them to commit. I think there's little tricks you can do along the way. Remind people to subscribe isn't bad every now and then. You know, just drop a little subscribe you know, lower third or, you know, just, you know, put a link in your description to describe. But I think the real trick to getting them to convert, give them value, make content they love and they find value in 
they'll subscribe on their own. You don't if, I, if I could just add on to that, you know, talking about the value, a lot of times people want people to subscribe on one video, but it's like, if, if that was any other business where if it's like, if we're just meeting for the first time and I'm like, great, you're all in, right? Let's get married. You'd be like, okay, <laughs> let's take a step. Yeah. So it's this expectation that a lot of people have. It's like, well, I did, I gave them great value. Well, you, you did that once. If, mm. if you can do it again, right? Like the reason that all of us have been successful is because that we didn't just deliver value once. We've done it multiple times. And that's really important. It's good. It's good. Brian, any thoughts on that? Getting, get, yeah, getting I, think, I think what Daniel said, I really like, and that is to just focus on what's most important and create great videos. And what I see for so many creators is they get, they get hung up and they get stuck on all the little things that don't matter too much. Mm -hmm. it, it really is true, like tags and closed captions. And someone asked, uh, one of the questions was like, um, maybe the, the, the metrics are important, but if you just, if you really strive to focus on one, one, uh, one audience and then you make great videos, like that's, that should be the goal. Like we need to see more questions, like how can I make a great title? How can I compel people to click? Uh, how, how can I grab attention with my thumbnail? What are the mm -hmm. things not to do with the title? When we start getting into like, why don't I get comments? Your videos aren't good enough, which I hate to be so blunt, but as soon as you publish great videos, I guarantee you'll have more comments. But sadly, think about this. If you're always asking the questions that don't matter too much to the audience, it's going to be harder to make it happen because you're not focused and what's most important to the, the viewers of your videos. It's good, it's good. Some really good advice here, guys, and we're coming up to an hour, so I wanna respect all your time. I know you guys are all super busy. Uh, some really good questions here. I think there's some more uh, questions that are being asked, but I wanna respect you guys' time. So uh, let's, I probably this is a good time to, to kind of cut it off, but I would love people to connect with you guys. Where can they find you guys on YouTube or online? Well, I'm easy to find uh, on, on you know, everybody knows my channel name uh, is actually Daniel Batal, so you can find me by my name. Uh, I also, my website where I do channel consulting for channels is uh, danielbatal.com. Um, but I also have a memberships group that people join that like to get a little more insight on how to grow their channel. So if anybody wants some deeper dive stuff and continue conversations like this, and uh, it's available in your region, uh, hit the join button under any of my videos or up on my homepage. You can see it right up there next to the subscribe button. And uh, and that's an easy way to connect with me. It's uh, $4.99 a month. Quit any time, have deep discussions, and, and uh, bring your own poodle. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Daniel. And Brian, where can they find you? Uh, same thing. Uh, search for Brian G. Johnson and you'll find me. It's not hard to find me. Nobody, no marketer tries to hide. Um, <laughs> Steph Stephanie, uh, thank you for your nice comment. Uh, I'm not so, sh so sure about a genius, but uh, I appreciate yeah. the sediment. And it was a lot of fun today. And here, here's how I want to wrap things up for people is that anybody can grow yeah. on YouTube when you want it bad enough and you start making decisions based on what you really want as far as growth, it's a lot easier. Um, so believe you can, and you're going to be on the right path. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. And Andrew, congratulations, by the way, you just hit 5,000 subscribers just like a few days ago. So that's congrats. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, where can people find you, Andrew? Is he frozen? Is he frozen again? No, he's yeah. pretending. He's or, like, or he's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that we can find Andrew Can right here on Andrew Can is actually the name of his uh, is his channel itself, and Andrew is the guy who uh, is really the brains behind the TubeBuddy channel growth. So, right. anything you need to know about uh, understanding the TubeBuddy software, come to the TubeBuddy channel, and you'll see Andrew there all the time. There he is. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much. Everybody in the live, make sure you connect with Daniel, Brian, Andrew, and uh, we will see you guys again in the next uh, next episode of the Creators Corner. We'll see you again. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, gentlemen. Take care. See you, Rob.